So I hope you are ready for chapter five of Little Britches by Ralph Moody. We are going to just go ahead and get started. We're here at the Caribou Public Library. Thanks for joining us today. So chapter five is called The Big Wind. I think it was my lying about the ties that got us the buckboard. One night I came in from tie hauling to hear father and mother talking together in the kitchen. Mother was saying, but Charlie, we just can't, we can't just load the children into that old farm wagon like cordwood and haul them off to church. We saved quite a little from what we expected to pay for the new horse and harness. Somewhere we should be able to find something better in the way of the conveyance that's within our means. Mr. Cash came by on Saturday and he had our buckboard tied behind his wagon. Sunday, we all went to church at Fort Logan. Church and Sunday school were held in the day room school, or excuse me, the day school room. There weren't enough seats to have them both at one time, so the grown folks stayed outside and talked while we had Sunday school, and we played outside while they had church. The fathers of most of the other children who went to Sunday school were soldiers at the fort. Some of the kids were kind of tough. I learned a couple of new words from them, and Philip learned a lot. He called Muriel a couple of them after we got home, and Mother cried so hard that Father sent us all into the bedroom. We could only hear a word or two that she was saying between sobs. It was something about not being able to stand what the ranch was doing to her boys. From then on, Mother held Sunday services at home. Father had been hauling long poles to be cut into fence posts for about a week when the big wind came. It was blowing when we woke up and tumbleweeds were rolling across the prairie like big brown bowling balls pitched by some giant in the mushroom in the mountains. By school time, it was too strong for Grace and me to stand against. By noon, it had racked our house until some of the windows had broken out and the doors were jammed fast in their castings. The whole house was vibrating like a beaten drum and every few minutes a joint among the rafters would crack with a report as sharp as a rifle shot. Father's face was gray and mother's milk white. Neither of them spoke, their mouths were clamped tight and their muscles were popping out and in on the sides of father's jaws. I could see Muriel, Philip and Hal crying, but against the roar of the wind, I couldn't hear them. Father went out and untied the horses. They drifted away to the east, the wind whipping their tails up under their bellies. Next, he brought poles and propped them against the lee side of the house. Mother huddled us into a corner of the bedroom, away from the windows. She crouched over us like a hen brooding her chicks. Then there came a tearing screech from the roof as the wind ripped away a section of the shingles and sheets of plaster fell from the ceiling. Father crawled in through the blown out window from a coil, with a coil of rope in his hand. He took his Sunday suit from the, the corner and told mother to put it on. Then he knotted the rope around our chests and shoulders until all but Hal were strung on it, the way mother used to string popcorn balls for Christmas, about five feet apart. Philip was on one end and Muriel on the other. Mu mother had taken off her dress and put on father's suit with the sleeves and legs rolled way up. Father tied Philip's end of the rope around her waist and Muriel's end around his own. Then he motioned mother to follow, tied Hal on his back like a papoose and crawled out the window. As she passed us out to him, he had us fall to the ground and lie still. After he lifted mother down, he crouched and told us to crawl on our stomachs like horned toads. That dust would get in our eyes, but we must keep them open so that we did not crawl into cactus beds. Our nearest neighbors were the Altlands, a mile upwind. Fort Logan was to the east, three and a half miles away, with no houses in between. Father crawled east and we crawled after him. <laughs> when we had wriggled along for a hundred yards or so, father stopped to let us rest, and I looked back toward Philip and mother. Philip must have gotten cactus spines in his hands because he held it out toward mother and tried to sit up. The wind caught him and rolled him like a tumbleweed as far as the rope would let him go. As he went, mother sprang to her hands and knees. There was She was no more than up before she sprawled forward on her face, as though some giant had put his foot on her from behind and shoved. In that same backward glance, I saw the roof of our new barn fly away like a sheet of newspaper. We started on. The next time we stopped to rest, I looked back again. There was blood on mother's face and our barn was gone completely. 
A few minutes after we had begun crawling again, something like the shadow of a great bird flashed past me on the ground. I raised my head and a second later, the body of our farm wagon struck a few feet beyond father. It bounced crazily like a football and flew away in kindling wood. My eyes were running from the dirt in them. My nose burned as though the dust of it were pepper, dust in it were pepper, and I was coughing from breathing through my mouth. At, as the, excuse me, at the next rest, I lifted my head again and looked up and down the line. Father was coughing hard. I could see Hal bounce up and down on his back. Philip was sobbing and gasping for breath against the pull of the wind, and Mother's face was black where dirt had mixed with the blood. I had no idea where Father was taking us, but after a dozen or more stops, I knew that we were going more north than east. We were not going to Fort Logan. We crawled across the wagon road and on and on. The wind ripped up, curled dry leaves of buffalo grass and raked them across our faces like jigsaw blades. At last, father stopped and waved his lifted arm. Then he raised them both and, we made motion, and he made motions like a man pulling himself up a rope. We all understood and drew ourselves up to him. There was fresh blood on the corners of his mouth. We got our heads close to his and he yelled, we're almost there, we're gonna be all right. It seemed hours longer before we crawled into the head of a gulch leading down to Bear Creek. Under the level of the prairie, we could crawl on our hands and knees. Father led us along to where there was an overhang in the west bank of the gulch. There was hardly any wind there. I was so tired, I could barely move and shaking all over. I wasn't frightened any longer and nothing was hurting me, but I started to cry. I didn't know what I was crying for, but I couldn't make myself stop. Everybody but father and mother was crying. The wind went down with the sun. At twilight, it was no more than a breeze. We crawled from, under, from our shelter under the bank, cold, stiff, and ragged. Our faces were smeared with blood, cut by the sharp grass that had been whipped against us by the wind. And our hands, arms, and legs were burning with cactus spines. It seemed to me that we had crawled miles on our stomachs. But when we came out at the head of the gulch, our house stood little more than half a mile away. It and the bunkhouse stood alone. Barn, privy, wagon, and buckboard were gone. The house leaned tiredly against the prop poles. From the wagon road, it looked like a deserted ruin. And when we got to the back door, father stood Hal down and put his shoulder against the door. It stuck tight and he heaved against it, but not as he had heaved when he lifted Nig's hind legs from the trestle. He looked tired and old. The inside of the house looked almost as deserted as the outside. Fallen plaster, broken glass, and dirt covered everything. Father coughed hard after pushing the door open and wiped his mouth with a red-stained handkerchief. Sometimes mother cried over little things, but she didn't cry then. She hadn't all day. She bustled right through the kitchen and into the bedroom with her underlip bitten in between her teeth. In a few seconds, I heard her shaking bedclothes so, that, so hard that they snapped. While she was doing it, father looked over the chimney to see if it was cracked and then started a fire in the stove. Next, he took boards from the bunkhouse and nailed them over the broken kitchen window. We youngsters didn't know where to begin in helping to get cleaned up and we stood huddled by the stove. When father had finished with the window, he put his hat on and started out the door. Mother came from, bedroom, from the bedroom while he was in the doorway and said, Charlie, where are you going? She spoke quietly, but her voice was husky, way down in her throat. Father said, I've got to find the horses. Heaven knows, heaven only knows where they may be by now. They may have fallen in a gulch. Mother went over and took hold of his arm. She stood close against him and looked up into his face. Her voice was still husky as she said, Ralph can stay home from school tomorrow and find them. You're going to bed. Father bent over and kissed her on the forehead as he tried to take her hand off his arm, but she wouldn't let him go. <laughs> Charlie, she said. It was only a little more than a whisper. We came here to save your life. Are you going to throw it away over so little? We need you. Oh, we need you, Charlie. From where we were standing, I saw her eyes fill up with tears, but none spilled over. As I watched her, I heard the fast beat of running horses' hooves. Oh, I heard him. 
Fred and Bessie Altland came into the yard, circled and pulled up at the steps. Fred jumped off the buckboard with the reins still in his hands and cried, Charlie, for God's sakes, what's happened to you, man? You look like a ghost. After Mother told them about the house nearly blowing over and about our crawling to the gulch, Bessie said they had worried all day because they knew we didn't have a storm cellar. They made us all go home with them and stayed for three days while Fred and Bessie helped Mother get our house fixed up again. Mrs. Altland and Mother wouldn't let Father get out of bed for a whole three days. <laughs> that is the end of chapter five. Wow, can you imagine being in a windstorm like that? We'll see you next time. Be ready for chapter six. All right, bye for now.